All right, welcome to Kate, Lydia, and Virginia. Thank you guys so much for joining. You are here for the webinar on perfecting your sales process and mastering the art of the close. You are in the right spot. We are just gonna give people a couple minutes to get in here and get settled. I, I was telling uh, Felicia that it is really nice here in Chicago. So it's always hard to get people on uh, these types of things when it's nice weather. And she said that it's really nice where she's at too on the East Coast. So um, wanna make sure that if anybody is out having a nice walk, they have enough time to come in and uh, to soak up this content. So we'll give just a couple minutes and then we will get started. Got a couple more coming in right now. And then feel free if you guys wanna come off video, if you wanna keep your video on, whatever's comfortable for you. It's nice, nice to see everybody. I see Virginia I like Kate, and Kate and Mike Reeves is on, um, not showing, but I just got my vaccine today. So I got my shot. So one more to go. Yay, I know, it's exciting, it's emotional. <laughs> I know I got mine on Friday, so. Oh. I I also got a little emotional too. Oh, good. Good. Well, they're saying, I just heard the like vaccine to vaccine people can start hanging out soon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and then, it, it, yeah, it's, it's going to happen soon. Yep. We'll be back in action. All happening. Awesome. Hmm. All right, guys. Well, I am going to just kick us off uh, to get started. There'll be a couple more people trickling in here, but Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Stephanie Gary. I am with Cultivate Advisors. I'm the relationship manager uh, at Cultivate. We are a small business advising firm. So what we do is work with small business owners to help them grow and scale by increasing revenue and profit, but doing it in a sustainable way uh, so that they can really enjoy their entrepreneurship uh, ride and journey that they're on. And we have partnered with Haven Coworking Community to bring you this content on perfecting your sales process and mastering the art of the close. Uh, what we've done is a two-part series. This is part two uh, of the series. The last one we did two weeks ago was on how to find the best CRM for your budget. Wanted to take that a step further and really help people kind of get some ideas around how to um, perfect their sales process. So that's what's brought us here today. Um, would love to kick it over to uh, Malu or Felicia. Who's going to be taking over? Felicia, you Malu. Want to Malu. Me. Right. Awesome. I'm uh, happy to introduce Malu Majovanich uh, with Haven Coworking, who is going to talk to you a little bit about what they do over at their space. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Malu Bojanovic and I am the operations manager here at Haven. We are a co-working space located in Fairfield County, Connecticut. And um, if you are out of town, uh, we do have a beautiful space uh, to allow you to work. Uh, but at the same time, we offer a number of educational events. Uh, and you can check that out at haven.com. We have uh, different events that range from business and strategy, finance, legal, marketing, and sales, just like this one today. Next. Uh, we also have a number of um, member exclusive events and programming to not only allow you to grow your business, but also socialize, network, and we even have some health related uh, events just for members. Uh, we offer a number of memberships and uh, that range from uh, uh, to allow you to work on the open space or private offices. Uh, for those of you who are, that uh, are out of town, we also have the digital and event membership and that uh, will give you access to absolutely all our events, among other things that we offer at Haven. So you should check us out at haven.com. And this is uh, some of the things that we have coming up. We're gonna be talking about Clubhouse on the 11, social media strategy on the 23rd, the art of the pivot on the 25th and uh, um, content strategy on the 30th. So really great programming that we have coming up. So we encourage you to check us out at haven.com. Thank you. Perfect. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Malou. And something I forgot to say is everybody, if you want to put uh, where you are joining us from into the chat, just to get a little bit of conversation going, uh, let us know where you are, are coming from. And now I'd like to introduce Simone Ashkar, who is our VP uh, at Cultivate, and she is going to be leading us through the content today. So Simone, go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, excited to join everybody here, uh, kind of focusing in on perfect, uh, perfecting your sales process and mastering the art of the close. So as Stephanie has already, already graciously introduced, uh, my name is Simone. I'm excited to be here with Stephanie and, and all of you. So here's what we're gonna do today. Uh, if I just look at what, what kind of the purpose of, uh, of the next uh, 40 minutes together or so, uh, we wanna just uh, be intentional to set up your business for success during your sales process and master the art of closing. So ideally you take two take, takeaways from today uh, and, and implement in your business. And I would call that a winning uh, hour over lunch. So in terms of an agenda, just to kind of walk through what we're going to be working through is we're going to be talking about kind of two different things. One's just perfecting the sales process. So I have two uh, kind of strong tips uh, to focus in on that can uh, go to your business and then mastering the art of closing. We're going to talk a little bit about objection handling and what the difference of being on the offense versus the defense is as, uh, as you work to close uh, clients or customers. So general expectations, uh, just for everybody to see, is the chat function is live. Uh, and, as, and as I'm sure you just uh, have, have used, if you have questions, throw it in there as well, because Stephanie will manage the chat. I'm not always good at multitasking, so I let her do that. Um, but then after this, uh, don't worry too much if you're trying to write things down frantically, uh, we will send you uh, the information uh, so that keeps it a little bit easier. So really take away those two to three takeaways, stick to those and the rest of it you can get uh, a little bit easier. So. Before we dive in, what I figured we'd do is just, I'd love to just know from the group, um, what is the biggest struggle with sales or closing that you're hoping to get out of today? Uh, I would love to capture those so I can be a little bit more tailored and intentional uh, as I'm walking through the next uh, 40 minutes. So if you wanna throw those in the chat box, uh, that would be super helpful. And as we do this, uh, I know Stephanie uh, alluded to just who we are, but I figured it'd be important just to, to slow that down here for two seconds and just know that uh, when I'm going through this, I'm very intentional knowing that we're talking to small business owners and that we're really intentional on who our audience is around whether you are a solopreneur and you're the, you're the only one in the business to you already have a bunch of layers in your business. You have a leadership uh, team and everybody um, operates within it. So I'm going to try to give you things that hit on anything from zero, you know, zero employees to a bunch of employees that you can take that away and have a productive lunch. So the way that we're gonna do things and how Cultivate works is we think of, it, of your business as a propeller and out of the propeller, there's different, uh, there's different stages. And so the sales is what we're gonna focus in on today. Uh, but by nature, it probably complements some of the marketing or the leadership or the recruiting that still needs to happen in order to make the business work. But we're gonna be really intentional today on sales. Uh, and the biggest reason is because sales is a huge lever for time and money. So I figured I'd throw this up there just as a starting point to get everyone thinking of why am I covering this? If you think about it through a really uh, equal lens and we just think about if you have a product that's $2,000 and you have a sales goal of 500,000, it kind of breaks it down for you. You need 250 products. The difference between a 30% closing rate, meaning that you close clients at a 30% versus a 40%, if we reverse that through time, you'll see at the very bottom of what the differentiator is by having 10% higher in closing rates. You could save yourself 625 hours during the year. And I'm pretty sure I can imagine that you'd spend those hours in a lot of things. Uh, so that's why we talk about this. And then it's not about uh, overhauling or perfecting anything necessarily, but it's about changing some things to get the incre incremental movements. That's what I'm gonna focus in on today. So as I do that, I just have to make the general disclaimer that some of this stuff will not be rocket science. It'll be stuff that you'd be like, oh yeah, I totally knew that. Is, but there's a difference between totally knowing something and totally doing something. And so my challenge to you is, are you aware of it and you're just not implementing it? And this could be a great reminder to do it. Uh, or is it something new? And so just think about that as you go through here. And then just remember and kind of think about graduated learning. Some of you guys may be at the very beginning and not great at sales. And others could be experts. If you're an expert, think about how you're going to relay this to your team, these key points. If you're a beginner, absorb it, take two, or th two to three things and implement them fully versus trying to take a hundred things and implement them all poorly. So double down on that. And I'm also going to just make the assumption that you have some sort of sales process. 
So I'm not going to go to the 1.0 of what is a sales process. I'm going to assume you already had that. And that's why we're perfecting it or going up, uh, going to notch it up a bit. So those are the things I'm going to walk through here today. And we're going to start with the sales process. Then we'll go here to uh, kind of the closing and objection handling, which is a lot of times where people's brains gravitate towards. But my hope is getting some of this stuff up front will actually ease some of that pain in the back end. So here are the two big things we're going to focus on when it comes to perfecting your sales process. We're going to talk about the buyer's journey, and then we're going to talk about the power of the 1% and what in the world I mean by that, okay? So when we look at this, the focus, number one, is about buyer's journey. And so remember, I made the assumption with you guys that you already have a sales process. So if you already have a sales process and it's already operating, what I've learned is that a lot of times you just kind of go through the motions and you start incrementally changing things to make your time more leveraged or to make things more easy in a process or to talk to your CRM or whatever it is. And so this is an opportunity where I say, hey, actually take a step back and actually look at it from a different perspective now. Are you focused on your buyer's journey and what they're actually ex experiencing? Or you, do you continue to bolt things onto your sales process because it's what you need to do in your business? And so the buyer's journey is a way to actually flip your brain and look in a mirror a bit and say, okay, if I was going through my process, what is actually happening here? And is it a strong process? And I've learned that you can find some gaps when you start looking at it through the other side and not what you need, but what the other person needs in order to make a decision. So my questions that I always uh, bring up is just what do they need in order to, to get to a sale mark? And so what are the decisions at each step in the sales process they need to make in order to move to the next step? That's the challenge I think about as you break down and it's uh, bit by bit of whatever that process is, if it's a 10 step process, look at that in every step. And then you wanna think about how do they get to that next decision? So how do they get from step one to step two? I don't care about step one to step 10 because we're missing everything in between, but in one to two, how intentional is it? And then what should they actually be feeling in that step? And if you go kind of that through layers a little bit deeper, or that layers deeper, what you should be able to see is in a couple of those steps, you may be off because they're more, they're easier for you, but you're actually losing some people because of the ease on you versus the ease of the buyer. So what I'd really think about is slowing that down and a way to have a little bit of framework to slow down each process to help you is what we call is a code. It's our shortcut to be able to make sure that we're organized and intentional with everything that we do. And so I wanted to share that with you and just think about this step by step. What is the purpose of the step? So why are you doing it? What is the outcome of the step? So what is it? What is the agenda within the step? What is what is the intentionality? How are you going to get to the to the to the start to the finish? And then what is the actual decision that needs to be made at the end of that step? And if you just go through each of these steps, what you'll realize is the purpose, you can be even more intentional. So I'm going down one more layer of the code of the P and you wanna connect it to the big vision to help them see what's happening. Then you wanna think about it in a very concise way so that you can stay with them. And then you wanna think about the outcomes. So establish what that actual outcome of the step is from the buyer's journey, okay? Think about it. Don't think about necessarily what's going to happen in, uh, for just yourself. But when you're in that sales process, you also want to figure out what the buyer's outcomes are. Asking the questions, not just proving the questions, but asking them, validating them, and then putting that into your sales process so you can be more effective in the future. That's why we find outcomes at each step early on with, with a buyer. The next piece that I think about a lot is just the agenda. If you make sure that you have a clear agenda every time you go through the sales process of what's happening, what's going to happen is you're going to be clear on all the, on the timing so that you don't run out of time or miss expectations. You're going to make sure that there's clarity in what the estimated timelines are. I don't know if anybody's experienced ever where they think they're going to go ask for a sale and the person's like, I wasn't prepared for that or I didn't know that was happening or hey, I need some time and all those other excuses. If we set it early before the meeting starts first at the end of the meeting, it allows people in the buyer's journey to be aware of what's going to happen at the end and making sure that all of the agenda or the, the outcome items that were established previously get funneled into that agenda. So there's enough time to answer that because most likely it's the most important thing in the buyer's journey that they want to get answered. If we don't answer it, 
the sale is probably not very likely, or at least not at the time. So those are the things I think about for uh, the agenda. And then finally, the decisions. It's like making it clear if we agree on the what's the agreed decision that needs to be made by the end of this. So keeping that filter on tracking and then making sure that you manage and look at the, the, the metrics behind it, you're going to really help yourself say, hey, seven out of the eight of my, of, of my process is awesome. I keep losing everybody here. It's going to allow you to identify and say, okay, well, it's because this decision's too steep or I'm not actually asking for a decision in this, in this step and it'll allow you to break that down a little bit. So that's just my general uh, rule is just in the sales process, define the code. And then make sure you're asking the questions and determine what step you're in, in that buyer's journey. And if you do that, you'll probably tighten up and make your sales process more impactful by just flipping it on its head and looking at the buyer's journey. So that's my first uh, action step. And then my second piece of focus is just talking about the power of the 1%. So I started off this presentation by telling, talking about the, the saving of time. How do you, what would you use 625 hours for? Well, if we think about those powers of the 1%, sometimes we take big leaps and say, like, we have to overhaul something. I'm just talking about the little stuff. So I'm going to give you some examples of why little things add up in a sales process and then wrap it together. So if we think about it as just the little things of consistency, do you send the follow-up email every single time you're in a sales process? In each step, do you send the proper emails? I'm sure you've put them down. Ideally, this is how many emails they get. Do you actually follow through and do them all the time? Do you set reminders so that you're prepared, that you're, you remind them to show up? If you have a slippage rate, as we call it, meaning that people forget to show up to meetings, do you send them friendly reminders just to make sure that they don't overbook you? Do you have any visual guides so that if their learners do not audio learn, can you give them a different way to learn and absorb in order to make a sale? Testimonials, proof is in the pudding. Do you actually make sure that they can see that you're, this is not your first rodeo doing this. Can you show them and, uh, and let them hear what other people do uh, and have experienced with you? Are you intentional with your follow-ups? Do you forget, hey, they're gonna follow up with you and then two months later you look at your watch and like, oh, I forgot about them. I wonder if they want this or not. Or are you really intentional and you have clockwork where you close out communication within X amount of days or X amount of weeks, depending on your, on your cycle of sales. And do you have that set up so if there's a routine in a system? Because if, it's, if, it's, if it doesn't happen consistently, it's going to be really hard to track why it's happening, which means that you're going to have inconsistent data, so you'll never know. And then you'll always feel like something's broken versus actually being intentional to figure out what is working and continuing it and being consistent. And then something as simple as a thank you note. Some of you guys that maybe are in a service business, the, the thank you note can go a long ways. Do you do those little touches that you said, hey, this would be perfect, but then you forget to do. So I want you to think for yourself and your own business is like, what are those little things that you've probably plotted out once that you may have forgotten about or maybe haven't plotted out? Could you think about that wish list so that if everybody had that happening, could that make a change? And the reason being is what's the value of each of these? I think about it through this lens, maybe because you send emails all the time more consistently you get a 2% increase in sales. Then the reminders, another 2% because those people would have never showed up if it wasn't for your reminders. So you've caught a couple extra people throughout a year. The testimonials, one person decided to make a decision because they read a testimonial they were blown away by. But again, that's one more sale in the year that you didn't, have, that you didn't originally have. Same thing with timing of follow-ups. You're more intentional and you're regimented and you're in intentional. So you actually know what's happening. Thank you notes, same way. Maybe you make a personal phone call to make it happen. But heck, now we're 10% of an increase. These little things that we just did, I have so much confidence that they're less than 625 hours worth of additional work. So that's the intentionality of what are you doing to incrementally grow by doing the details. And then you may be thinking to, uh, or looking at me and saying, yeah, if a perfect world, if I had all the time in the world, I would do this. But I run out of time, my life gets busy, my business gets busy, I just don't always do it, right? Here's what I'd recommend. Identify what needs to happen and make one of three decisions. Automate the steps, so emails, reminders, all that stuff can be automated. And then it's just a, a reaction. 
Zapier is a great way to do it where it zaps one thing to another. It makes it all work electronically versus through you. And if you're like, well, I don't, it, this isn't an, it, an automation type thing, then delegate it. Get someone else to do it on your team. Get a virtual assistant to do it. Somebody else. But have it happen. And if those two things don't work, then leverage it. Spend some block scheduling where it's like, okay, in these blocks, I'm always going to get all these things done proactively. So for the next 100 sales I make, I'm always going to have these things pre-stuff. If you use physical stuff, it's a great way to have a, I used to do what we call like a stuffing party. And I get all of the things stuffed. So I had 100 proposals ready. So then when I went to those meetings, it was grab and go versus, do I have all the paperwork? Did I remember how to print this out? And it was just ready to go. So something very simple to be able to leverage that or, or, or use uh, parties can help tremendously. So that's my power of the 1%. Get those little things lined up, figure out then how they get executed so that 100% of the time it's happening. And so if you do that, you're, you're, you by nature will increase your closing percentages. So that's my process of things of just how to increase and perfect the process. Because my anticipation is at one point, you probably looked at your process and said, this is perfect, but then you forget to go back to it. You forget to track it to actually make sure it's happening the way that your vision had it happen initially. So that's my recommendation here of the top two things to really dial in here. And so I'm gonna switch over then. And a lot of people probably have been thinking to themselves like, okay, I wish uh, if I do have all this, most of the time, it's just, I get to the end and they ask me these questions. So they, there's these issues that pop up how do I handle them? Like I always get caught up, uh, caught off guard. So I'm going to put two simple focuses around objection handling that I'm really actually going to dive into. And it's going to be about the offense and the defense of objection handling. And so if you don't have any idea what I'm talking about, offense versus defense, I'm going to give you this little analogy here. Scoring a sale is awesome. Winning it early, win it early, not late, right? This is offense. Oops late creates fights and has, and has emotion attached, right? You've probably been in this spot. You start getting defensive. They start then wanting to get out of the room. It's a little awkward. So we're going to look at both sides because they happen. But we're going to focus on the offense and the defense. I'm going to pull those two apart because my feeling is we can get less defense if we get really good on offense to score early. So let's talk about this offense. And let's talk about the idea of surfacing objections versus waiting for objections. So very simply put, what you want to do in your business, there's probably three objections that happen over and over and over in your business. They might be tactically a little bit different, but I bet you there's three buckets you can create. So if you think about that for yourself right now, I'll give you a second. If you're like, I don't know, I, they're all over the place. I'm just going to pull to somebody who's really talented and not me. Every sale has five basic obstacles. No need no money, no hurry, no desire, or no trust. Zig Ziglar said it best. These are the five basic obstacles that you face in your business. You might have little things that attach to it, but these are the roots of what it goes back to. So if you could pick the top three on the list, what's going to happen is you're going to be able to be way more intentional at being offensive against it or teaching your employees how to be offensive against it and baking it into your process uh, around the corner. So to surface, what we're going to want to do is we want to ask direct questions early in the sales process to start the conversation. So we're not going to wait to the end to do it. We're going to, we're going to pepper it through. So an example of that is let's take a common objection. The service is too expensive. These would be proactive, direct questions to ask to get the feelers going. Have you purchased this service before? If we find that out, we're gonna be able to start narrowing in on their experience or what their expectations of cost are. What are you expecting this to cost? Right? Then we figure out if we're even going to be in the ballpark or to build value or what we're going to have to do in the future based on what their current perception as a buyer is. Do you have a budget set aside? How much? Find it out early versus at the end. 
How do you perceive value or measure return on investment for this service? If you ask that early, you're going to be able to be a little bit more proactive in what you do. So when you think about this, my, my, when you put it in con or without context and just early in a casual conversation at the beginning, they aren't realizing they're giving away the nuggets that are going to help you close later, but you're going to be able to collect them. And I always think of it as like this, you're a squirrel and all you're doing is want to collect all those little nuts so that at the end you have a big pile and yet you're able to then make the sale. That's kind of the mentality here. So another example, just to put that out there, is a common objection in a business could be needs time to think. Same idea. What are some direct questions to ask? By what date will you need to purchase this bike so that you can get a landmark in order to create urgency? How will this date, uh, or why is this date important to you? Figure out why it's important. That'll build some urgency. How do, you, uh, how do you think a delay in, in your decision could alter things from either side? So an example of this, right? If you find, figure out they need something by a specific date and we are up front and we say it takes six weeks in order to get, to get to you and they need it six weeks from now, it's a pretty easy way to connect the dots. They're gonna have to make a decision quickly. And if they don't, what will that do for them and have the feelings attached to them versus issues with you? Are you open to making a decision quickly upon getting all the information needed? Find that out early, it's easier later. So these are all types of things that if you're training a sales team or just training yourself, you can think to yourself, okay, I have these common objections. These are my issues. What do I do with them? And so if you do that and there, it's, e it's easy to be direct early because there's no context to it. Hey, have you thought about, have you thought about a cost around the service? easy now versus at the end when I'm already showing you a price and asking like, well, haven't you thought about that yet? Very different tones that can happen and very different perspective that can happen. So remember, it's easier to do this up front and early in a sales process to collect the information than do it reactively after they've already made a decision of some sorts. So I know it's easier, like anything said than done. It's not always perfect to get this information, whether it's tough on you asking it because you're new, or maybe it's a tougher client or a tougher customer, or there's more layers to it. So you can't see it all the time. It's probably important to know some of the defense too. So if I look at the defense and I say, okay, well, what are some important things to be really good on defense uh, in sales? I'm going to give you a, uh, one of my techniques, which is called Llama with only one L uh, that hopefully will remind you and keep you pro uh, organized in a process to make it happen. So this is how Llama works. This is reactive, remember. You're gonna listen, you're gonna acknowledge, you're gonna make a statement, and then you're gonna ask a question. And that's the process of, uh, of Llama uh, up front. And this is a way that you can get in front of uh, people if the, or, uh, once you're behind in order to understand an objection handle. So an example of this is you're too expensive. Right. They now told us after we've already asked for the job. So what we we'll want to do is we want to listen to whatever they have to say and acknowledge. So you're seeing value in our service, but you can't move forward in your mind at the current price. Acknowledging that. Right. I'm hearing them. I'm validating. And then I make a statement. I certainly understand money doesn't grow in trees. I find we're very compar uh, we're comparable and the ROI our clients get is really good. That's our statement that we make then back to them. And then we ask another question. What ROI would you expect at this price point? How are you comparing our price to others in the market? And that's going to be a circular thing you can work through to, under, to get them to understand. And maybe it's them educating themselves, but it's sometimes easier for someone else to say it than to you to say it to somebody. So them acknowledging and realizing, oh, I guess I never really thought about it, or I don't even know what the price is. Well, then how is something too expensive if they don't even know what the price is supposed to be, right? And you can go into a different path with them once you understand and do this. But if you jump immediately to questions without understanding what's happening, or you don't make a statement, 
So then they are just feeling like you're a question master. You're not going to get anywhere with it, or it's going to be harder to get places consistently. So this is kind of the process of llama that might help you work through a reaction of somebody telling you, meh, maybe, I don't know, or yes, but any of those kind of objections, this is a great process to help you through it. The other technique, which I just find to be pretty simple, is the feel, felt, and found technique. So a customer gives an objective. It's the feel, felt, found is what you have to go through in terms of your process in order to get to an outcome. So in order to do that, this is how I do it. First, I want to empathize. I want to understand what's happening there between feel and felt. Then I think to myself, what is the problem solving that needs to happen in order to get them across the line? And then I ask them again. But if I don't go through the funnel of things, I may just jump to my needs versus the other person's needs, which often doesn't get very far. So again, I'm going to keep giving you examples here. Let's say you're too expensive is the objection I'm getting through the sale. I can understand what it feels like to see a service desired, but price doesn't add up, right? I feel them, I empathize. I know others have felt similar and have experienced sticker shock, right? Uh, many have found that the ROI received completely outweighs the cost. Would you be open to continue to explore this with me? Feel, felt, found, right? And so what that will do is it'll reopen up a conversation or a willingness to have a conversation by using some of that language to get back to that problem solve and get through the process to get to your yes. So those are the kind of the cycle that I always think about when it comes to the reactive or the defensive mode through things. Okay. And so my other piece that I like to slow down with, I'm just going to give you three tips that didn't quite fit in my box, but I think are important to, to work through. So one of my number one tips I always give anybody who does sales is stay quiet when you're handling. So have you ever been sitting down with somebody and you ask for the order, right? And then there's that pause. Gets a little bit awkward. Nobody likes silence. My biggest tip to you is zip the mouth. Do not say a single thing, no matter what. I have seen the most dramatic of these sitting in the kitchen, trying to get an estimate to paint a home. And I was sitting with somebody who was about to peep and I kicked them under the table to make sure that we were staying silent using my own philosophy. And then we sat there just awkwardly for two minutes as the person processed, but that's what they needed. That was the buyer's journey in order to make it happen. And after the two minutes of the most uncomfortable silence, we got the sale. I don't know necessarily what he was thinking. And at the end, I didn't really care as much, right? But I had to sit through it. And also then what happens is I'm not throwing in a potential objection for them to piggyback off of in order to get out of something. I need them to come to the table and make a decision. Yes, no, or let's have a conversation. I can't be leading that. So simple, but incredibly important because silence is awkward and don't talk yourself out of a sale. Tip number two that I always like to make sure I slow down on is objections that they give you mean help. Help me. Does it mean you're wrong? doesn't mean they're right, but if we try to actually just solve to help them, we will get farther and, 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 and get more out of our sales process. At any point when you try to win, this is what will happen. You will create a lose-lose and hurt the brand. You'll create a lose-win, meaning that you're going to manipulate them across the line but then we all know what happens when we don't set the right expectations in a sale. And then we have to go service the sale. It isn't pretty. Or the other end of things is when the customer, the client wins. And then the whole time you're mad because you're losing money or margin, or it's not the right time. So it just is 
frustrating on your end and you may hurt then the service of things because of the frustration. None of that is good. So you want to work to solve, to get that win-win partnership so that everybody moving forward is serviced properly, they have the right brand experience and you can go through your sales process. So remember objections aren't bad. It's just about asking for help. And our job as the expert in the sale is to provide that help and to solve what they need. And my final tip that I like to sit on and slow down here on is just what it actually means uh, when someone speaks, okay? If they say no, and they give you an ex a negative ex explanation, and they're negative towards it, probably means no. But if they say no, but they say, but I really like you and you know, you're, you're such a nice person and I really enjoyed this process, just understand that's actually an objection. There, you can actually go solve that through some of the tactics we've worked through and it's worth it because you have a piece of trust that's built through your character and likability, but you're missing on something that's making them want to go deliver this with you. And remember the objection is just them needing more information. So seek to understand what do they actually need in order for us to partner together to move forward. And if it's truly the benefit that they're going to get better and they're going to win and you're going to win, solve to get that win-win situation. Don't cave or give up because it's hard. Because if you do that, remember, you're going to set future you up for much harder. And vice versa, if you go and win and don't let them have their voice, they're not going to be comfortable entering that partnership, which also then makes for distrust or potential issues down the line, then inevitably is just going to cause you way more time in the future. So spend the time up front, go through the discomfort or the silence or the, 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 the seek to get on the same page of things, because if you do that up front, you'll be much stronger on the back end and the consistency of things. So those are my three kind of off, off the cuff tips here that, uh, that I always recommend when it comes to going through sales. So before I fully wrap these things up, what I want you to do here quickly before we go into any kind of questions is I want you to think to yourself on this laundry list that I just gave you, whether it's through your process or it's through your closing, uh, how to close uh, through objection handling, I want you to just capture two things in each bucket that you could do better in your sales process to be more consistent, to be more effective, or to be more intentional. If you can grab just one or two things, you're never going to implement the list of 400. Put those down on paper or shoot them in the chat so other people can see them to, to, to stir up some of their ideas. And usually that's the best way to start getting tightened back up in your sales process to continue to be effective. Because remember, 10 more percent can mean how many more hours? And I encourage you to go run that math for yourself because it will be worth the fight to figure out if you have to automate, delegate, or just leverage or get better at, and it will go a long ways. So in the end here, if you're like, there was a lot of stuff, I didn't get to write it all down. Remember, that's no problem. We will hand out the deck in order to help this uh, go. And we're also gonna get some sort of free resource to help organize you within that deck uh, to make happen. So if you're thinking to yourself, if I get this deck, I'll generally know what's happening or hey, maybe the resource will help, but I probably need some help getting to the actual implementation. Like I'm always good at putting things on paper, but I could use some help on figuring out how to get them to action. We are also gonna offer some time with some of our advisors to actually help you with that, with that action free of cost. So what my ask is to use, if you're like, Hey, I really like some help to tighten up this sales process or these, these objection handlings were good. I just don't know how to implement them personally into my business. Let us help you. So what we're going to do here is two options. One is just to have Stephanie, uh, just email Stephanie directly and she'll help you and get that set up and she'll have a conversation with you. And if not, what you can do here is just, I think we're going to launch a poll or uh, uh, that Stephanie's going to do that. If you want one of these three things, you just click in the box. So if you want all three, click all three. If you want one of them, click the one. 
and we'll make sure we provide whatever resource is going to be most effective to you uh, as we close out here today. So what I'm going to do here for the next 10 minutes is just make sure I answer any specific questions you have within your business uh, that could be helpful. I always want to make sure I leave enough slush time here for that. So uh, if you have any questions or Stephanie, if I missed any questions while doing it, you want to spout them off and I'll uh, do my best here to answer them. Awesome. Yes, thank you so much, Simone. That was fantastic. Uh, I really appreciated all of the things that you covered. There's a lot of good reminders in there. So like Simone mentioned, um, we will be sharing all of these resources with you guys. If you wanna just book a call with me and you wanna sit down with one of our business advisors, I put my uh, calendar in the chat box um, or else I'll just send you an email afterwards. Looking at some of the questions that popped up um, we did have one and Kate, who is joining us today, she is an interior designer and she was curious when it would be the ideal time to send thank you notes. Um, like, thank you for hiring me as your interior designer. So what, what are your oh, thoughts on question. that? Yeah. I think there's probably two things you could do with a thank you note. Uh, one is if you use it on the back end when you already have a sale happening, it could be a great way to be able to add things on the future or, or start the, the relationship uh, off right in order to get more out of the relationship so that you can actually increase your, um, uh, your average sale, so to say. So that could be a great way after. But I would actually think about it up front. Like, what are you doing? Is it through a consultation? And whatever that consultation, that estimate, that whatever that is in your process, uh, where you either sit down with them or you spend a little bit more time, right? I'd say like anywhere over 30 minutes. That's someone taking a fair amount of time out of their world. If you give them a thank you note, that could be the time where they actually are like, wow, this person's really personal touch. And it's that mentality that everything's online these days. So actually like receiving a physical thank you note or a thank you email that's intentional and genuine can go a long ways. So that's probably where I would land on it to actually increase the amount of people that give it, push them over the line at that step to say yes to you. Mm -hmm. Especially where something is personal as an interior designer, I feel like people are kind of craving that connection with the designer that they choose. So that would be a big one. And then something that I messaged Kate in the chat just for others is that um, after you do close the sale, you know, depending on what your what type of product or service you're selling, um, but use that opportunity in a thank you note to ask for referrals. You know, that's a great time to be like, hey, you know, it's so wonderful working with you. I'd love to work with more clients like you. If you know anybody else would love to, you know, see if I can help them out as well. So don't be afraid to uh, use that. Obviously, referrals are the best kind of business. So best thank you, okay. right? Yeah, right. Um, we went through handling price objections during this um, and how to, um, so I forget who asked this, but somebody said, how do I recognize if I am being too pushy to the client? Yeah, um, I think uh, asking open-ended questions versus closed-ended questions can help tremendously to figure out, am I, how am I gauging this? And so an open, a, a closed-ended question is a yes or no. And if I get a yes or no of something, it's a one word answer. I can't really read the person very well, but if I flip it and I ask them more open-ended questions, so they have to, have to explain themselves. That's typically how I'll figure out if someone's being pushy or not. So uh, one of the questions I ask is like, hey, I know I've covered a lot. Help me understand what kind of questions you have up until this point to make sure that I can actually go and make uh, answer them as we keep going here. And so it allows them to kind of think and process, and then I get to kind of recalibrate with them or, hey, on a one to 10 scale, I know we're early in this, but just how are you feeling? One being not very good, 10 being really good, just so I can kind of understand what the seriousness of this is, like put a scale in there. Um, and that usually gives me a good enough that if I trial close or I test enough, maybe two to three times within a process, I won't feel then pushy because I'm so aligned to the expectations they've set and what we're working towards, because every piece of the journey, I'm clear on what the outcome is. Hopefully that answers a couple of it, or a little bit of it. That's a good one. Um, and then Felicia just put into the chat, what is the best way to map a buyer's journey? Do you have some standard formats to use? It's a good question. Um, what I would say is um, there's two ways to do map a journey. One is to get a family, friend, or somebody trusted to go through your sales process 
Uh, so you can actually experience and they can experience it from their end and give you true feedback. So that's one way that you could probably get a little bit of mapping without it being new. But then the other way that I think about it is you should be able to bite size down your process. There should be some sort of uh, lead in the door. Then there's first contact. Then maybe there's something. And then there's final contact, which then gets you to uh, ask for the order. You should be able to break that down just in general of your process. And then once you have that broken down steps, whether that's, I don't know, four to 10 steps is kind of, I would say is, is the sweet spot. You then look at each of those steps and say, okay, what do I need to do in this step to get to step two? What is the actual only decision that needs to be made? Because it's not the yes, I'm asking for the order if there's 10 steps. It's just willing to sit down for another extended period of time or whatever it is. So that's what you have to break down first. And then it's a lot more digestible to be able to look at the buyer side and say, okay, if I was buying this, what would I need to decide? And then Malu just put in the chat, said, are there any differences in the closing tactics we should keep in mind when handling a lead in person via email or over the phone? Uh, great question. Uh, in general, like the, you can see people, you can see reactions, you can see the strength. So there's probably difference that I would be acting if I could not see anybody right now versus if I can see people and read. So I always say that probably the strongest close you'll have is being able to be in person with somebody because then you can kind of, for lack of better words, trap them into making a decision with you. So it goes from a phone would be my strongest that I would say is a tactic then the, to a phone call, then to an email. And then I would, uh, same kind of conversation is like, you don't want yeses and nos until you're asking for the specific order. It's the only time you want a yes or no, unless you're trying to lead up to something. So open-ended questions, no matter what process you're in, whether that's on the phone and email or in person, because the more that they're talking, they're talking themselves into the sale is the most important thing. So getting that temperature at any point, whether it's on the phone or in person is great. And then over email, it is tough. It's the only way I can put it. If you're trying to make a sale on an email and the controllable factors would be again, making them answer more questions versus giving you a yes or no or waiting for it. So I would turn them from an email to a phone call to optimize your abilities or your opportunities. So my sale would be on an email. Hey, would you be open to having a phone call for 30 minutes to discuss? That's all I would be saying. It'd be never about making a decision. that's probably the best way to go about it. You always want to hear them over email is always tough or over zoom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot of misinterpretation. You can, you can misinterpret reading, right. Of things and aggressiveness and all that kind of stuff or language barriers. There's tons of things that just, there's too many variables. Are there any other questions that people have that they, Ooh, here we go. Trudy just said, what's the best way to handle we need to think about it and we'll get back to you in terms of following up. Sure. So uh, proactively, what I always wanna make sure happens is that you make, uh, you set the stage of when, it is, when the decision needs to be made. And so uh, what you can, what my general rule is, no matter what industry, no matter what I'm in, is like my responsibility through customer service and through my brand is I always get a decision, whether that's a yes or a no. So at the end of this, we'll always make sure we're doing one of, uh, one of two steps. Do we make a decision yes or no today, or we set up a time to make a decision yes or no. And my responsibility is always to close a loop, whether it's a yes or no, that's part of my brand. And I, when I say that up front, it makes me feel way more comfortable on the follow-up so that if they say we need to think about it, it's like, great, walk me through your decision-making process just so we can figure out what's the best timing for a follow-up. And when I actually have them walk through their process, it's usually not very complex. So sometimes you can say, great, can I just give you 10 minutes to discuss it? And I'll just pop back out and I'll come back in in 10 minutes. Sounds like it's a pretty quick decision. Or it's okay, you, so you need to walk through this. And when are you going to be doing that? I just want to kind of understand what the temperature gauge again, because I want to always make sure I'm servicing you. And I never forget about you as a customer. You're so valuable to me. I would love to just make sure we close the loop on this, whether it's a yes or no. And when I do that over and over and it gets to my language, I don't ever have maybe, like the maybes are the worst. You want yeses and noes. Otherwise you'll never be able to control a process. So I just get that decision then, whether that's one week, 
one day or one year, I guess I wouldn't do that, but just that would be my, my optionality to make sure there's a decision call that's happening so that you can close the loop. I think the focus here is just like that consultative sales approach, you know, where you're setting proper expectations the entire time at each stage of your sales process. And then, you know, using these open-ended questions to not pigeonhole yourself into these corners, but to just keep, you know, it an open back and forth. That's, that's what makes people feel most comfortable and most vulnerable. And they're going to give you a lot more that you have to work with so that you can be more likely to close the sale. So the more consultative that you can be in it and having that open dialogue, the better you're going to be off. So kind of going back to my lose is that it's easier to do that when you're in person um, or just having those kind of set times that you're going to have those conversations over the phone or on a Zoom meeting. So just keep those in mind. Same thing, just to like uh, the other one I would think about is like, if you know you're going to be meeting someone in person and you want the decision there, the conversation, the email, everything leading up to it should mimic that saying, hey, I can't wait to, to meet you in person. Again, the decision that we're going to make uh, is X, Y, and Z or whatever it is. You say that up front so that they should be already thinking about it. And you may even be sparking questions up there so that by the time they get to your doorstep, you're already then expecting them to have a decision by the end. Otherwise it's weird on them and nobody wants to feel weird. So they'll make it happen. 80% of the time, 80, 80, 20 year old. Anyone else have any other questions? You are welcome, Trudy. Um, and then I had said earlier that I was gonna do an example of a pod Simone, do you have an example of a pod or do you want me to go? Uh, just in general or? or yeah, just like a doing? general one because you said like the purpose, you know, just for somebody to hear it. I'm yeah. So this purpose of this webinar is to help you understand uh, how to uh, prop, or uh, let me restart that. The purpose <laughs> of this webinar is to uh, perfect your sales process and to handle some objections. So really the outcome of what I wanted to have happen here today is for you to get two or three things that you can walk away with and implement immediately. So in terms of outcomes, I want you to be get one on the sales side, one on the, uh, on the objection handling side. Here's the agenda of how we're going to walk through that today. I'm going to go through two buckets. Here's this and this. Other bucket is this and this. That's what we're going to accomplish. The only decision today is, do you want the deck? Do you want the tool? Or do you need more help implementing this? Those are the, you got to make one of those three decisions here today. So pretty simple, for example, like in at Cultivate or in anybody, you know, in any sales process, you typically want to have some form of pod at the beginning of every step so that people know what to expect. Again, just setting those expectations for um, the prospect so that they feel comfortable. They know what they're going into. They know how much time you have there and what you're expecting out of them. So. Yeah. And you'll probably see if you look back at this, I uh, intermingle decisions and expectations but PODE is an uh, easier word to say than P-O-A-E. Uh, so it just rings a little bit easier. Awesome. Any other last minute questions before we let you guys go? What would be, would it be good to use the PODE in a consultation? Absolutely. I do a pod in every meeting I have. My team makes fun of me because they think sometimes I'm a robot, but I always get good expectations and, and there's a good outcome that happens because I can always check back in on it. Mm -hmm. It's true. She does do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Well, everybody, thank you so much for joining us and spending the past hour. Simone, thank you for walking us through this. We hope you guys found it valuable. I will be reaching out to see what uh, resources that you want and uh, please uh, feel free to contact us. And then also, Felicia, do you want to say any final things? No, I, I uh, just, again, thank you so much, Simone and Stephanie, for putting this together so well thought out and presented. Um, and I'm looking forward to working you, with you more on some other projects. So i um, love to get everybody's feedback on this, but um, I, I think this format works wonderfully. So thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you for helping us put this together for everybody. Have a wonderful Tuesday, and uh, we will talk to you all soon. Thanks so much. Thank you.